Foundation, and we're uh, very proud and happy to have you here. Yes. So our guest is Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who's a former Chief of Staff of Sec Sec Secretary of State and Politics. He also served as the Associate Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff under the Directorship of Ambassador Richard Haas. And he was responsible for the East Asia and Pacific political, military, and legislative affairs between 2001 and 2002. <clears throat> Before serving at the State Department, Wilkerson served in the U.S. Army for 31 years. It was a quite a department. Uh, during his time there, he was a member of the faculty of the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, he was special assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and, uh, for uh, General Paul Powell. Uh, he was director and deputy director at the U.S. Marine Corps War College in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, Mr. Wilkerson retired from active service in 1997 as the rank of colonel and, and works as an advisor for General Powell. So what we'd like to do is have him uh, give us maybe a 15, 20 minute presentation on his thoughts on what's happening and then we'll engage in the question and answer period. Please. Thank you. Um, I was at uh, Temple Emanuel in New York City last Friday night speaking to about 300 people who had assembled for the remarks and to contradict uh, his hint that I look youth more youthful than maybe I am. I actually had to turn to the rabbi and say, I got to sit down. And so I sat down on the top tier of steps and finished my address. A lot of people looking at me like, uh, what's happening? Uh, I'm seven, almost 75 and my hip is really giving me trouble. So I'm really grateful you got me a seat. And I don't have to stand up. Increasingly in my seminars at William and Mary, I, I like to walk around the seminar and uh, get really close to my students. Um, Increasingly, I sit down in a chair and speak to them as if I were amongst them, which works pretty well, too. I wanted to talk to you today from a point of view which I am absolutely certain you do not have. Because you would have had to have been with me and taken the exact same route, or roughly identical route, that I took in the military community and the academic community off and on for about 30 years add the last 20 and 50 years, teaching on two of the most prestigious war college campuses in the military, some of the best men and women in the military, and then teaching now for 15 years on two civilian campuses and doing case study after case study that ramified and gave me even a broader and deeper and more profound understanding of some of the things I'm going to hastily tell you here today as background. In 1984, leaving the regular army in the form of the 25th Infantry Division, the Electric Strawberry, in Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, I moved to what the Army said was going to be the kiss of death for my career. I did it anyway because I thought I needed to use the very excellent education I'd gotten at the Naval War College about a year before that in how to be a strategist and how to match strategy with political objectives, with policy in other words. Everything from the Cities, Peloponnesian Wars to World War II was the subject of our analysis and criticisms. And I thought I got a pretty good education and what the heck was I doing being an infantryman in the 25th Infantry Division when I should go to St. Pat, then the largest and most powerful unified command the military had, indeed, in the world, and serve someone who was doing strategy and policy. And so I did. You may recall that in 1984, we were watching from that position. Why in Honolulu? Because we were the most powerful command in the inventory. And everybody got his forces from us except for Europe. So we were the force provider for the Rapid Deployment Joint Task Force in the Middle East, soon to become the Central Command. We were the person you had to go to, the command you had to go to to get military. You may also recall that we were in the midst of the most brutal war in Southwest Asia probably in 500 years, the war between Iran and Iraq. You may recall also, and I can vividly attest to this, that our policy was to support both sides. From time to time, we would sell Hawk missiles and tow missiles and so forth to Iran through the Israelis, 
who were also dealing with Tehran, very well dealing with Tehran. And from time to time, we would give them intelligence. Yes, on Iraqi formations. And from time to time, we'd do the same thing for Baghdad. We sell them weapons. There are many who say that Donald Rumsfeld's famous trip to Baghdad to Ronald Reagan was to sell them chemical precursors. I can't attest to that, but I wouldn't doubt it. We had a metaphor at St. Pac. We called it St. Pac at that time. Donald Rumsfeld changed commander-in-chief to combatant commander. A foolish move, but nonetheless took away a lot of the majesty of being in a combatant command. Imagine saying that, combatant command, instead of sink or commander-in-chief. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld was asserting his civilian domination of the uniformed military, if you will. Uh, an assertion that I, at the time, would have supported. The military was getting too big for its riches. But at that time, the metaphor at sea fact was, we will let that war go on until there's one Persian left and one Arab left, and then we'll issue them dueling pistols. <laughs> That's cold, hard, ruthless, strategic reality. Well, it didn't turn out that way, of course. We took Saddam's side in Operation Earnest Will and Operation Praying Mantis because it looked like Iran might actually cross the border into Iraq, ultimately winning the war, whatever that might mean. So we took Saddam's side. First we used flag Kuwaiti tankers, and then we actually, in Operation Praying Mantis, sunk one Iranian destroyer dropped a 500-pound bomb down the stack of the other one and would have sunk it too had Ronald Reagan not called us off. And we destroyed the command and control platform in the Gulf that they were using to conduct their operations in the Gulf. And the Ayatollah, of course, is supposed to have said, English translation, I don't speak Farsi, I drank the Himalaya. In other words, he gave up, let the United Nations come in and adjudicate a ceasefire and an end to that bloody, bloody conflict. As a result of all of that, and then as a result of Dick Cheney, then Secretary of Defense's visit to Saudi Arabia, when Saudi Hussein sometime after that decided he would re-annex his 19th province, then known as Kuwait, we were of a strategic orientation that said never put a U.S. boot on the ground in Southwest Asia, the Middle East, or any portion of Africa. Never. That was our strategic mantra. Never. Because we knew once we did it, two things would happen. The military complex with its industrial background and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and all the rest of them would flow into the region with a vengeance, as they have done. And anybody that tells you that withdrawing 2,000 troops from Syria is a great detriment to American security possibilities is just smoking something really low grade. Because we still have the greatest force lay down of our entire military in that region. Just click them off. Al Udeed and Qatar, 11 fields in Saudi Arabia, the greatest reception facility for military on Earth in Kuwait, the largest naval fleet headquarters in Bahrain, exercises annually with Egypt, and a host of other places where we still have military power, absolutely contradicted the strategy, the policy that I grew up with in the military, and the realities that went along with that. Then goes Richard Cheney, just prior to the kick out of Saddam's army from Kuwait, first we're going to cut it off and then we're going to kill it, says Colin Powell, and makes himself a Hollywood movie star on television, and tells the king, if you want to be secure, you need us. And out of those two momentum, as it, momentums, as it were, flows this massive presence today and more deadly and more dangerous, as every military policymaker, planner, and strategist knew it would do, just as the Joint Chiefs of Staff predicted what Truman's recognition of Israel in 1948 would eventually do, 
It has contaminated U.S. foreign and security policy to the point now where we simply can't sever ourselves from it. And it all devolves down to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's allies and Israel. So as I went over to the Congress, Senate and House, over the past 12 months, with everyone from the Quakers, from FCNL, to Win Without War, to Pogo, you name it, different people with whom I lobbied the Congress, as it were, to try and stop United States support for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, the little Sparta, as they call themselves. As I tried to do that, I became vividly aware in real terms of how contaminative this decision making was throughout the 80s and 90s. It is so bad now that you cannot talk to a senator who otherwise ought to have a brain and a critical analysis process in that brain about anything regarding Saudi Arabia without him talking about investment in the United States, money, oil, all manner of things other than cholera, humanitarian disaster, thousands of children dying, ridiculously brutal war fought by a ridiculously incompetent state, and the UAE, despite their title of Little Sparta, is not a whole lot better. You simply are mind-boggled by what you encounter in those offices in terms of opposition. Everything from one senator telling me, well, this is a niche issue, Larry, and my looking back at that senator and saying, thousands of people dying, cholera, famine, a brutal war that makes no sense, a brutal war that Saudi Arabia and the UAE are losing and will lose. Just look at Nasser's experience in Yemen in the 60s. My old friends in the Egyptian army, many of whom I trained earlier, call their experience in Yemen their Vietnam. They're losing that conflict. None of that. Greatest humanitarian disaster since World War II, the UN has called it. None of that influences these people unless they are predisposed to be influenced, like those members of the Progressive Caucus and the Black Caucus and so forth, some of them anyway, who are just against this because they're against the war power being so excessively in the, in the hands of the executive, or they're against war altogether, or they're against, more, more likely, stupid war altogether. So I really got vivid insights into how this Congress, and probably Congresses that preceded it, and sadly enough, Congresses that will follow it, has no stomach, not only for reasserting its constitutional war power, but in particular no stomach for doing it in an occasion, on an occasion, Yemen, that would seem to me to be so ripe for the taking that it would be an absolute no-brainer for them to do so. How much better a place can you find to reassert legislative war power, constitutional war power, than a brutal, nonsensical, masochistic, narcissistic, Mohammed bin Salman fiasco, and yet you can't get it to happen. When we finally got the vote that we got in the Senate, it was because, as much as anything else, of the brutal killing of Jamal Khashoggi, which reminded me of Stalin's comment about, you know, you kill one person that's murder, you kill a million, it's a statistic reversed. I mean, here we got all these people dying. We got school buses full of children being hit by Raytheon and Lockheed Martin ordinance, and yet, the death of Jamal Khashoggi gets us 11 Republicans, some of them as co-sponsors. And indeed, we finally, much too long a time to do it, but we finally get a House vote and a Senate vote that more or less rebukes not just the President of the United States, but also the Saudis for doing this. And it's going to be vetoed if it hasn't already. I didn't look this morning to see if he had actually signed a veto. Um, what's going to happen then? Well, no members of my party, Republican Party, are going to cross the aisle that I know of. And so the veto is going to be sustained by there not being enough votes in the Congress to override it. 
an odd circumstance historically because as you all may be aware in 73 when they passed the War Powers Act, Richard Nixon vetoed it and they passed it over his veto, which gave it a solidification that otherwise it certainly would not have had and yet it hasn't been invoked until now, which is a positive but not positive enough. So going back and consulting that history, and the reason I rehearsed a little bit of it for you here today, is because it's an aberration. It's an aberration of good military and good national strategy to do what we're doing today, and yet we're continuing to do it. So the question becomes, and the question that my students wrestle with in seminars, in an attempt to answer it and to give a credible answer is why? Why is the United States of America in thrall to Saudi Arabia and particularly to Mohammed bin Salman, who I think is one of the biggest thugs on the face of the earth, and to his counterpart in the UAE, and ultimately to Bibi Netanyahu in Jerusalem, I can't say Tel Aviv anymore. Why is this happening? And my students come up with several answers, but they always come up with two or three that are the same seminar after seminar. The first one is, of course, money. The second one is Israel, and that is a real multifaceted one, as you might imagine. And the third one is, as I indicated earlier, it's where the military fiefdom is well hidden, because most Americans would think I was nuts when I told you that their major forces are laid down in Southwest Asia and the Middle East. They think we've pivoted to Asia, or that we're somewhere else, like NATO in Europe or what have you. No. We're in Southwest Asia and the Middle East, and if you count Afghanistan, which I do in Southwest Asia, it's a pretty huge contractor and military personnel commitment, not to mention the cost of war project at Brown has probably, Brown University has probably done the best on this, not to mention that we spent four to five trillion dollars in the last 17 years, or will spend another of that trillion on the veteran load we've created coming down the pike at us, which if you haven't looked at the VA budget lately, is climbing like a rocket. And we won't take the right care of these veterans. We have never in our history taken the right care of our veterans post-conflict. But we will take some care of them, and that's the estimate that puts it up over $5 trillion. We could have sent every young person in America for the next decade to a four-year university of their choice and ability to enroll in free for that money. As Eisenhower said in 1953, every battleship built is so many bushels of wheat. Every fighter that is rolled off the production line is a modern hospital. And he went on and on. This is 53. This isn't in his famous military industrial complex in 61. He's speaking to the American Newspaper Association. He's saying, this is no way of life at all in any true sense, I'm quoting, under the threatening cloud of war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Now, he borrowed that from William Jennings Bryan, of course, a cross of gold, but nonetheless, it's effective. It's powerful. And he was right. He was right. My students will take on Monday their National Security Council simulation. It's an exercise where they play the National Security Council, including the president, and they make a decision. The scenario before them is Mohammed bin Salman has just been assassinated. And the House of Saud is in disarray. And ultimately, the intelligence flows into them over the course of the first hour and tells them that there's a real problem, much worse, much more profound than the 1979 attack on the Grand Mosque, which you may recall brought in the French and the Pakistani commandos because the Saudis were not competent sufficiently to do it, and we didn't have any, we didn't interpose any objections to the facts and the French coming in because we didn't want to come in because of what I just reiterated to you. We didn't want to have boots on the ground in Saudi Arabia. This is 79. Um, and my students are going to have to deal with that. And the ultimate question they're going to have to deal with 
when the national security advisor for Bibi Netanyahu appears on a video teleconference and tells them that they must defend Saudi Arabia, they must not conduct a non-combatant evacuation operation, they must not stay on their containment areas and in their airfields, they must come out and defend Saudi Arabia because things are really going to hell in Riyadh. They're going to have to make the decision. Does the United States leave that tyranny forever? Or does it stay and defend it and be even more embedded in that poisonous region than it is today? That's a heck of a question. And most of my contemporaries would say, that'll never come about. That'll never come about. The House of Soviet is forever. That'll never come back. And I remind them that when I was at the Marine Corps War College in 1994, I conducted a core size exercise and I put my Marines down in a place called Pristina. And I'll never forget one of my Marines asking me, where the hell is Pristina? And I said, well, it's in a little place called Kosovo. And, you know, just looking at history and looking at the map and what's happening in the former Yugoslavia, I suspect you might have a chance to get there. Now, I'm not saying that I'm prophesizing the fall, the fall of the House of Saudi, but I am putting my students in a situation where they have to make some pretty serious decisions, and they are more or less free to think critically and long and hard about those decisions. Whereas what I've discovered in my lobbying for an end to U.S. participation in this brutal war in Yemen, senators and representatives and I suspect the White House on mass are not. They cannot think critically about this. They are too embedded in some of the things I've just described to you. They are too attracted to some of the things I've just described to you. They are too ignorant of the repercussions that might flow from some of these things. And they are too caught in the inertia of Washington to do anything about it. I'll finish with this note. You may not recall this, but Dr. Rice actually passed a speech around. This was not something the Bush administration did very, very much, let other people look at their speeches. That we at the State Department looked at with some angst. Bill Burns and others who had an opportunity to look at it. It essentially said the United States, in, in, in so many words, the United States policy in the Middle East had been flawed for a long time. And it more or less pointed at our support for authoritarian leaders, dictatorships, and less than savory regimes. And it suggested that over the next few years of the Bush administration, however that bottom that might be, and possibly other administrations, that ought to begin to change. It got really mixed reviews at the Department of State, and it got mixed reviews in the White House. It was toned down considerably, but nonetheless, that sort of thematic approach remained. She gave the speech, and that's it. Not a thing changed. No one did anything different. You could say that President Obama, perhaps, in his abandonment of President Mubarak, was trying to sort of toe that line. <laughs> but it's not really the thing we want to do. What we want to do is perpetuate failure, just like we want to perpetuate endless wars. We've now been at war almost 18 years. And if you think about it, we've been at war for 27 years because we own the North and the South of Iraq. No fly zones. We and the British were still flying them at the time we invaded in 2003. Another catastrophic strategic decision destroying the balance of power in the Gulf, and putting us on track to be so deeply embedded with the Saudis in order to stand off against Iran that we don't have a clue, let alone inclination, to break away from that embrace. And that is a very dangerous situation, perhaps along with nuclear weapons and the rise of China and a filling station with a capital <laughs> called Moscow, amongst the worst possible situations we face in the world today. Thank you.
me ask the first question, uh, just in regard to, you know, we talked about the, the power of the money that comes out of uh, the Middle East, uh, but one thing that has changed most recently is that the United States, for the first time, has become energy self-sufficient for all practical purposes. I mean, we're actually exporting oil and gas. How does that change the geopolitical outlook of what maybe might change the way Congress looks at the Middle East and uh, the effects it might have? It's an excellent question, and it has lots of ramifications, but it's one I tried to use. Um, it didn't go. It didn't wash, which told me immediately that the senator or representative to whom I was speaking at the time uh, either knew what you were talking about, intuitively if not intellectually, or it didn't make any difference to them. Now, back up for a second. I was just at San, uh, in San Angelo, Texas, at Angelo State University, and as it happened, the provost, who was my host, was a Permian Oil Basin man. Uh, Angelo State had just gotten its first check because it owns, I think he told me, 15% or so of the mineral rights in the Permian Basin, and its first check was something like a quarter of a million. It gets one every month. Uh, plus it gets other things at the end of the year, the fiscal year. Um, he gave me a briefing on the Permian Basin that was just stunning. I had not heard this anywhere else. He's an old man. I assume he knew what he was talking about. Because of the new technology that improves almost every day for slant drilling and fracking while you're slant drilling, sometimes you don't even have to frack, and other techniques, we're not only at 13 or 14 or 15 million barrels per day production capacity, dwarfing the Saudis at 12 or 13, and maybe even rivaling Iraq if she were to come online because Iraq has more oil than Saudi Arabia now. It's just the insecurity and lack of money and technical ex expertise and so forth that she can't bring it all online, but sooner or later she will. Um, and then you confront the fact that the Saudi, Saudi oil minister himself said the Stone Age didn't end because the world ran out of stone. And you go to Houston and talk to Royal Dutch Shell, and they will tell you that they've already made a $5 billion decision to go to gas because they don't think they are going to be able to sell, burn, they'll say, the 20 trillion, 20 trillion of assets that they know are recoverable and within their writ. So how do you put all these things together? How is it so important one way or the other with regard to oil if we're going to have to come off oil very shortly and you even have majors who realize that? Is it that much of an advantage? I didn't find it an advantage in the Senate or the House. So you had a question over here? Yes. Uh, Wait, hold on. What do you think? You're good to speak. We're recording oh. this, so if you don't mind. Yeah. Sorry. Colonel, what do you think would propel uh, the description of the situation from which I totally agree with, from description of, of, of what's happening to some action that stems uh, the tide? You know, we talk, we criticize what's happening in Yemen, and it still uh, is going on. Every day, tens of young people are killed. Babies uh, starving. Uh, I'm not Yemeni, by the way. It's just you know it, it brings me to tears every time I, I watch the news and see what's happening there. And we know who the perpetrator are. Uh, you describe them, and we seem to continue to do the same business with them day in day out. I worked for two governors in Virginia. Now they're both U.S. senators. Both seem to disagree with these policies, yet I don't see anything happening. I work for Kane. I work for Kane and for Warner. One is the ranking on intelligence, and the second one is very important member of the armed services and foreign relations. And they, you know, in my conversations with them, and I'm not exposing anybody here. I'm just telling you something that they announced to everybody. You know, they seem to be opposed to what's happening there, yet. I don't see any momentum. I guess I turned my question into kind of a, a venting of my frustration, but I think you got the gist of what I'm saying. No, your, your point is a good point, and I'll treat it as a question because Tim Kaine and I have basically not corresponded in a long time because I find his position absolutely despicable. Um, he will talk to you all day long about the original AUMF, 
That's the authorization for use of military force after 9-11. Which, incidentally, you'll note that John Bolton and Mike Pompeo just came out and accused Iran of having real substantive contacts with al-Qaeda.